abandon free market principles to save the free market system. In a world of conventional confusion. Uh, there will be time for them to make profits. Uh, now's not that time. Daddy, what do taxes pay for? Oh, why everything. Policemen, trees, sunshine. And let's not forget the folks who just don't feel like working. God bless them. Don't be afraid of your freedom. Prepare to unshackle your mind. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Your professor has arrived. Tom Woods. Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Wednesday, August 20th, 2014. We're talking about intellectual property today, specifically patents, with Stefan Kinsella. Stefan is the author of Against Intellectual Property. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. C4SIF.org is the website. And he is the founder and executive editor of Libertarian Papers, which publishes scholarly articles in the libertarian tradition. Stay tuned after my conversation with Stefan for a look at what's coming up later this week that you will not want to miss. So, of course, you are all subscribed on iTunes or Stitcher, right? Which you can easily do at TomWoodsRadio.com. Warm my heart and give yourself a commute-sized chunk of liberty education Monday through Friday. Stefan Kinsella, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. You, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other people, really are the go-to person when it comes to intellectual property from a libertarian perspective. In this episode, I thought we would try to keep the topic relatively contained, even though it's still a big topic, by talking about patents in particular. I think it might be useful to start off if by having you recount for us what the traditional account is as to why it's necessary to have government protection of inventions in this way by means of the patent system. Absolutely, yes. So uh, patents are one type of many types of what's called intellectual property nowadays by vendors, and they use the term intellectual property to kind of sell it to the people. But patents were typically their own type of thing. Uh, The word patent in, uh, I guess, Latin means open because it was it was granted as a letter patent, a letter patent by a monarch or a king, giving someone the uh, the exclusive right to do something. Basically, it was a monopoly privilege. So um, uh, you'll see letters patent being granted historically uh, to playing card companies or to the first guy to explore North America. They would have these exclusive rights. So patents were like an open letter of permission from the government or the state granting you the exclusive privilege to do something. In around 1623, this was being abused so much in England that the Parliament passed the Statute of Monopolies where they limited the power of the government to grant the monopoly patent grants. They limited it to inventions. So they, they took away the power to grant most of these patents, but it remained for inventions. And then the U.S. adopted it in 1789 Constitution because of inertia. And the theory became more of a... Um, uh, of a utilitarian one, that we need to have a policy tool whereby the government can get some kind of incentive to people to come up with new ideas. Um, and so the idea is we'll give you a temporary monopoly, and the Constitution per- uh, limits this to temporary times, and um, uh, presumably this will incentivize uh, people to both come up with new ideas, to innovate, come up with new inventions, and also to disclose their ideas to the public. Uh, In fact, in the patent statute in the U.S., the stated goal is to encourage disclosure, not to encourage innovation. So the so-called patent bargain is this. If you disclose to the public the details of your invention, instead of keeping it secret under trade secret law, then we will give you a 17-year monopoly, roughly. Okay, And then the idea that people use to justify this now is this law and economics, Coastian type approach, uh, the idea is that um, uh, you have an, a greater incentive to innovate if you know that you can reap monopoly profits for some period of time after you start selling your product. Now, there is a certain plausibility to that, of course. I think that is why the average person who doesn't himself 
stand to gain directly from the patent system. He doesn't expect to to develop any kind of invention that will benefit from the patent system, nevertheless accepts it because he says that, well, I'll get more innovations than I would otherwise because, of course, if people get rewarded for doing something, they're more likely to do that thing. Now, it turns out, though, that according to the literature, this seemingly obvious conclusion is not really borne out. And I think if that's true, then it becomes easier for libertarians of a utilitarian bent to go along with what you're saying, because the free market, it so happens, just tends to be better from a natural rights standpoint, from a utilitarian standpoint, from any standpoint you care to imagine. And I think some libertarians say, but uh, but when it comes to patents, I guess we just need them because without them, we all know there'd be less innovation. But it turns out maybe there wouldn't be less innovation without them after all. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. So so I think that people are in favor of patents because they're used to the system. They see that the West is productive, and they know that we've had the patent system as part of our fabric for 200 years, and they sort of assume these things go together. And plus, they're called by their advocates intellectual property. So there's an association with the word property. And there's also this sort of lingering uh, kind of vague idea, the Lockean idea, that you own the fruits of your labor. If you work hard in a free market then you're going to prop. You're going to. And so the idea emerges that you have some kind of right to the fruits of your labor, and if you extend that, then uh, this contributes to the idea that patents are good. Um, but by and large, the, the prevailing assumption on the part of the average person is that these patents are necessary. They may be a cost. They may be a pain, but they do stimulate additional innovation. Um, but in fact, you would think that in the last 200 years, since the founders of uh, well, more than 200 years since 1789, when the founders put this provision in the claw in the, in the Constitution, and believe me, at the time of, of the founding, they didn't have a lot of empirical studies proving that uh, the patent system was necessary for innovation or that it caused gave rise to more innovation than we otherwise would have for a fairly reasonable, say, cost to society. Um, they didn't have any studies. It was, it was a hunch, we, we could say. You know, the founders saw it, thought it might be a useful tool that Congress could have in its arsenal. And, of course, the Congress passed the Patent Act the very next year, so they didn't waste any time using it. But you would think that in the last 200-plus years, someone would have done a study sort of unambiguously showing that the empirical claims that patent proponents make have been um, uh, borne out. But no one can do this. All the studies seem to indicate Way. And we have lots of empirical examples and case studies and historical cases. For example, uh, the, the, tip, the typical case trotted out as the obvious place we need patents is the pharmaceutical industry, because um, if you don't have a patent or a monopoly on your pharmaceutical compound, as soon as you sell it, then you're going to have imitators and competitors, and you won't be able to recoup your, your R&D costs. Um, but the, the truth is that Switzerland, Italy, even Germany for quite some time, for decades in the 20th century, had no uh, stringent patent protection of pharmaceuticals, and they were among the world's most innovative pharmaceutical uh, producers and innovators. Um, I think like 17, 18, 19, 20 out of the top 20 medical innovations and in drugs techniques in the last, say, 100 years, most of them had almost nothing to do with patents. Uh, people just don't realize this. Um, it's too much to get into here, but I would suggest for anyone who's interested in this, take a look at Chapter 9 of Boldrin and Levine's book, Against Intellectual Monopoly. It's online for free at their site, againstmonopoly.org. And they go through in detail uh, to, to discuss the empirical case about pharmaceuticals. They show why there's so many assumptions that are just um, just wrong. But what's the harm in it, though? I mean, somebody might say that, yeah, maybe it's not necessary to have patents, but what's the positive harm in it? Maybe it maybe it still backstops innovation in some way. Certainly there can't be any harm in it, or can there? Well, so, so Rothbard and, and other economists, Milton Friedman and others, have pointed out the quite obvious um, insight that, that if nothing else, the patent system distorts and skews innovation, research, and development because the patent system inevitably only protects some types of innovations and not others. So, for example, most patent systems don't protect, um, well, no patent systems protect abstract ideas um, or scientific phenomena. So, for example, Albert Einstein's E equals MC squared formula was not protectable itself by patent law, and yet it's, it's, so it's something that's clearly beneficial to the human race. 
And so you have this artificial distorting effect. Companies will put more money into things they can protect by patents as opposed to things they won't. So it distorts the structure of innovation and research. And that's not a good thing for the government to come in and distort things. And there's lots of evidence that patents uh, reduce innovation and, and reduce efficiency. So, for example, if Hewlett Packard and Canon and Epson, all laser printer makers, all have patents on their own laser cartridge designs and things like this, and people cannot make uh, generic cartridges that are easy to use with their printers. So they all have different standards. So it, inc- it encourages a diversity of standards. That's inefficient. Um, and also there's increasing evidence that it reduces innovation. So, for example, um, in, in the smartphone context, we have Apple, Samsung, Google, um, Company, very large companies that are the big smartphone makers, and they all have mountains of patents that they've acquired, and it costs them millions of dollars to do this. And what they will do is they will sue each other or rattle their sabers, and they will eventually come to a settlement agreement, which increases the cost of their products, and they pass these costs on to their consumers. And yet small companies can't even enter the market because they would be sued out of existence by one of these big players. So it causes oligopolistic type cartel, a reduced number of people that can compete. So it actually slows down innovation. There's no reason to bother innovating if I can't sell a product in the field, if I'm like a small company or an upstart or a new entrant. So, and then furthermore, the studies that I've seen, you know, like back of the envelope calculations, it's hard to get this right. But my estimate is that the patent system in the United States alone probably imposes on the U.S. economy at least 100, 200, 300 billion dollars a year of just dead weight loss to everyone because of lost innovation, cost of attorney's fees, litigation, uh, slowed down innovation. Um, so actually the patent system reduces, um, innovation. And not only that, it has other effects too. It actually, it actually literally causes people to die. It kills people, um, when drugs are not put on the market because uh, someone has a patent and they can't make enough of the drug, like in the Fabrizyme case, which I sent you a link to, um, or in, uh, in the case of the anthrax scare a couple decades ago where Cipro was the drug that was being made in limited quantities because one company had a patent on it or and or an FDA sort of monopoly license. Um, and also it reduces freedom of speech. I mean, the Adam Carolla case you mentioned in the beginning, here we have patents being used to threaten podcasting, which you and I are doing right now. Now, this is one of the ultimate forms of freedom of speech, the use of podcasting. And we, here we have someone, some patent troll holding a patent who is threatening the right to do this. Um, that's a serious uh, invasion of freedom of speech. And if, I don't know if you want to get to this later, but we could get to the patent troll issue that you alluded to earlier. Yeah, and, in fact, yeah, let's do, let's do that, actually. Because actually, sure. you, you and I talked about that off the air, so let me just fill in the mm-hmm. listeners. We were talking about the case of Adam Carolla dealing with a patent troll. The patent troll is trying to claim that he has a patent on what, podcasting itself? Yes. So yes. Uh, explain how that's it possible. It wasn't called it. Yeah, so it wasn't called podcasting when he filed a patent on it. He filed a patent on it before podcasting even existed. But if you read the patent claims, it des- it describes something kind of similar to podcasting, a sort of chronological serial stream of, of, of media files that are available from a central ser- – I mean, you know, it, if you read the claim, it seems to sort of cover what podcasting is. Now, a patent troll – technically called in the patent industry an NPE, a non-practicing entity. And that just means someone who has a patent that doesn't cover one of their own products, but they can use it to extort payments from other people who do have a product that the patent covers or a service that the patent covers. Um, And these are called shakedown artists or patent trolls because the the metaphor is like a, a troll at a bridge who exacts a toll for you to pass the bridge. Um, and everyone hates these patent trolls because they're, they don't make products. But the patent system has never required you to make, make a product that the patent covers. Um, so it's really a bizarre straw man. And, and as, as I told you earlier, although patent trolls, uh, there are studies showing that patent trolls have cost the U.S. economy about half a trillion dollars in the last 10 years. And this is serious money. <laughs> um, so I think they do slow things down. They're like a big tax on the economy and on the consumer and on innovation. 
But that's all they are. They drag it down. They slow it down. They're more like the mafia in a neighborhood compared to the IRS. The mafia actually provides some services and only wants a taste. They only, they only want to whip their beak. They don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Patent trolls are not competitors of the people they sue. So they don't want to use the patent threat to shut down their, uh, the, the, uh, their victims. They just want to extort a payment. And they want them to go on making products and making a royalty, uh, making a profit so they can pay royalty payments to the patent troll. So in that sense, if I'm a company making a product and I get approached by a patent troll, the, 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 down, the downside is I don't have a way to sue them back. I don't have a way to counter sue them for infringing one of my patents because they're not making anything. But on the other hand, all they want is money. And they don't want too much money because they don't want to kill me. But if a competitor sues me, especially if I'm a small company and a large company that's a competitor or that I want to compete with sues me using their patents, they don't want royalties from me. They want to get an injunction from the, from the courts that shuts me down, and that's a more existential threat to a business than the patent trolls are. So as bad as patent trolls are, they're not nearly as bad as the people that are actually practicing entities using their patents aggressively to maintain their sort of monopoly or oligopolistic position. So the problem with the patent trolls, then, is that they are annoying, they're shaking people down, they tend to be very high profile, a lot of people you know may be affected by them, but once they get what they're looking for, they go away. They don't try to shut you down altogether, they don't try to drive you out of the market. They're not actually a competitor. They're not providing a good they're just trying to drive you. Uh, uh, they're they're just trying to drive you to pay them something. They just want to earn. They don't want to destroy you because then they won't be able to get anything from you. So it was exactly. interesting. Yeah, it was interesting to read your take on the patent troll to find out that the, that of all the problems with patents and people exercising them in an anti-competitive way, this is the least of the problems. Now, I want to go back to something you said earlier, though, because you seem to be implying that there are philosophical errors at the root of the argument leading to patents as being desirable. There's a problem that some libertarians have in clearly understanding what property is and what entitles you to property. I'd like you to explain that, because I think if we think about this clearly, then we begin to understand that there may indeed be something problematic with intellectual so-called property. Well, I, what, what I've come to see is that the... Uh, to, to have a really clear view of this, okay, I, uh, my, my sort of trilogy of thinkers on this issue is, is Mises, Rothbard, and Hoppe. I think the insights that those three thinkers have, have, uh, have developed and have expounded uh, enable us to see things more clearly that we need to see more clearly now. I think 20, uh, 50, 70 years ago, the more metaphorical, Lockean-type language was, was adequate because uh, we didn't live in a digital age, and all of property – was not a huge problem. It lurked in the background. It only affected a small number of industry players. The average person didn't really have to deal with it. Um, and so just the idea that you have, uh, you have a, a right to homestead unowned resources like land because you mix your labor with it, as Locke would say, makes perfect sense. But if you drill down into the details of it and the way Locke worded his argument, the way Locke worded his argument, it, he was responding to Filmer, who was defending the monarchical system. So Locke wanted to distance himself from that. So he started out saying everyone's a self-owner, and you own if you own yourself, you own your labor, and if you own your labor, you own what you mix it with. So he came up with this argument to try to justify personal, individual ownership of things that God gave to the world in common, instead of this Adam is a monarch type idea, which Dilmer would use to justify monarchical holdings. So I think, in a way, Locke overemphasized this, you own your body because God gave it to you, you own yourself, you own your labor, and therefore you own what you mix with it. Um, it's understandable why he did it, but nowadays we need to get really precise about this because uh, this, this way of putting it can lead to two lines of thinking, and one would lead towards the intellectual property idea, and one would lead against it. Locke's original insight, I believe, is totally congruent with what Hoppe and, um, and Rothbard and Mises would emphasize, which is the role of scarcity means. We live in a world where we can't do everything we want at every time. There are scarce means. There's a possibility of conflict among men, 
and the use of resources which only have one use at a time. And if we want to live in a peaceful, you know, harmonic, cooperative society where we get along with each other instead of fighting all the time over resources, then we have to have rules for who could use a given resource at a time. So all rights and all property rights ultimately are about who is going to be the owner or the rightful controller of a given scarce resource. So it all comes down really to that. And Locke's view points towards that, but when he starts talking about how we own labor, I think that's the mistake, and people will get that in their head. So you'll hear that the modern expression is everyone's entitled to own the fruit of their labor, or they'll say things like um, uh, they, they own the sweat of their brow, which is actually a doctrine in copyright law until fairly recently, until the fight decision in the 90s. Um, and so these are metaphorical descriptions. I mean, you don't really own the sweat on your brow. I mean, actually you do, but that doesn't mean what people mean it to mean. And in my view, labor is just a type of action, and it's a confusion to say that you own your action because your action is what you do with your body. So under libertarian principles, we do have a property right as human beings in our body, but that gives you the right to use your body as you wish. So the action, the right to action, is a consequence of owning your body. And if you don't make the mistake of saying you have a property right in labor, and in fact, some people argue that uh, Locke's mistake about uh, not just Locke, but peak thinkers of his time, mistake which we call the labor theory of property, in a way contributed to the labor theory of value, which was adopted by Adam Smith and then which contaminated Marx and led to communism and the whole thing. So I think you have to make a choice. Do we have property rights and scarce resources? Do we have reasonable, rational rules for allocating property rights there? Or are we going to go with this metaphorical idea about labor being the central thing? And I think we really have to jettison this idea of labor being central to really anything. I don't think it's central to economic analysis. It's not central to labor value theory, and it's not central to property rights theory either. Well, also, of course, the idea of ideas is tricky from the point of view of property, because ideas, as you and others have said, are not scarce. The fact that you can have an idea, and if I have the same idea in my head, it doesn't preclude your having that same idea simultaneously. I can multiply the idea in many people's heads, and yet no one is deprived of the use of the idea because more heads are entertaining that idea. So we're dealing with something that certainly is not is in some other realm. And intellectual property, particularly in the case of patents here, it looks to me as if what you're saying is that you are claiming, you the patent owner, that because you have an idea of how to arrange certain physical things into an invention, that your idea in your head is something that you can own. It's a type of property that you can own, but in expressing that idea, what you are saying is that people who have real property, real things, real pieces of wood, real hammers, real nails, are not allowed to use those physical goods because of some phantom in your mind. Yes, and I, this is why I said that the ideas of Mises really are the most important things to really get straight if you want to uh, understand these issues, because Mises, uh, his, you know, his idea of praxeology, his idea of the, the logic of human action, is just very, it sounds like a complicated word, but it's just a very simple, common sense way of understanding what we do as humans. What he says is we act, and when we act, we, we look at the world, we have an idea about what's going to happen in the future, we're never completely sure, but we're not completely unsure either. And we have a feeling about what's going to happen if we don't intervene. And we have a feeling about what state of affairs we would prefer to happen in the future if we do intervene. So we look around the world, we use our knowledge of our own abilities, the way your body can work, the way we can interact with the world, the tools available to us, or the means or the scarce resources available to us. And we make a decision about how to use these tools to change the course of events, to try to achieve an outcome in the future that we prefer better. That's called profit or success or just, you know, the, the, just a successful human action. But if you understand human action in this way, you see a clear distinction between, I mean, you don't really even have to say that ideas are not scarce. You just have to ro- recognize the difference, um, the difference in human action between knowledge or information or recipes, as Rothbard calls it, basically knowledge or information, 
and there's tools that we use with this information. So the information that we have about the way the world works guides our decisions about how to use these resources. And the way property rights work is they provide exclusive rights of control recognized in some legal system to the means of action, to the resources that we need to use. But the information that guides our choices is not subject to property rights or, or should not be, need not be subject to property rights. Yes, because it's not scarce, but simply because it's not – that's not the role of it in human action. The, the very reason for property rights is because of the possibility of conflict when we all want to use the same resource to ac- accomplish a given end. That conflict cannot arise if we all want to use the same recipe to use our own resources to achieve a similar result. So, for example, if a million people want to build log houses using the same design, they can all do it as long as they all u- they use their own – lumber, right? Or if they all want to make the same type of chocolate cake using the same recipe, they can all do it as long as there's property rights defined in the ingredients used to make the cake. But there need not be property rights defined in the recipe used to make the cake. That's knowledge that guides the human action. So I think if you keep these distinctions in mind, it helps you realize what the big mistake is in trying to treat information like it's a scarce resource that's subject to property rights. Now, Stefan, the common argument for patents is the utilitarian one, that without them, we'll have less innovation. And you even hear libertarians saying this, without patents, we'll have less innovation. Now, of course, that is not a good libertarian argument, because I could think of a lot of ways to encourage innovation that would be unlibertarian. We could have outright subsidies for innovation. We could have a policy whereby we we break, we break we crack the kneecaps of everybody's uh, competitor uh, if if they manage to invent something first, then they they get to crack the kneecaps of all their competitors. That'll get everybody raring to go for innovation. I mean, but that obviously would not be good, and it would not be compatible with libertarianism. So, of course, it's not enough to say it encourages innovation. It has to also be consistent with libertarian property rights. But having said that. 98% of the public, perhaps even including libertarians for all we know, is still going to be moved by that utilitarian argument. Now, at the beginning, we referred to some of the scholarly literature that has shown that this is not nearly the home run that people think it is. But let me just ask you, even granting that this is not a good argument for patents from a libertarian perspective, nevertheless, how do you answer the traditional argument that if it, if it weren't for patents, why would I go to the trouble of – many, many years of research into some great improvement in consumer welfare, if I can't capture profits from it, if it's immediately taken by people who invested none of the the money that I did in developing the product. It is like a free rider problem. How is that overcome or can it be overcome? Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of answers to this, a theoretical to uh, practical. Um, n- number one, I would say, usually I hear that argument from people that really don't actually rely on that. It's just a hypothetical. It's like, why would I write the world's best-selling novel if I don't have a copyright? And, you know, they're not usually J.K. Rowling. They're just someone who says they might write a novel someday. Um, in my experience, and in the experience of everyone I've talked to who is in this field, Listen, we deal with engineers and, and big companies and companies that have uh, research and development, high tech, all the time. I've never seen in my life, in the last 20-plus years of patent experience, I've never seen anyone uh, actually come up with an idea for the benefit of a patent board. They would have done it anyway because they need to do it to make their products better than their, that of their competitors or to satisfy the needs of a given customer. Um, you, know, you have to innovate to make a product to do what your customer wants it to do. Um, um, so I would say that, number one, um, th- there's simply no proof. I mean, look, my view from seeing the evidence and seeing what's going on is that we would have much more innovation uh, without the patent system. So the patent system encourages um, ol- oligopolies and monopolies, and it reduces competition. And you can tell this. And by the way, John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, for example, who were all kind of in favor of the IP idea as a policy tool, but none of them thought it was a natural right, which you can tell because they thought it should last for 17 years or some limited term. Natural rights, property rights, don't expire after a given term. So even John Locke didn't really believe that his uh, his ideas supported the idea of, uh, of, of, of IP. Right. So I would just say that the evidence shows that all patents do is 
and look, and its proponents explicitly say this. Um, there, there are quotes from free market thinkers. Uh, they will say, we can't have a regime of unbridled competition. In other words, they want to bridle competition. So what they're doing is invoking the idea that's used all the time in protectionist arguments. You will have some, uh, some uh, infant industry, and they will claim they need protection from competition from China or Japan or whatever. So they will beg the legislators to erect tariff barriers or protectionist barriers to protect them. Literally, it's protectionism, right? So they don't want the competition because their, their complaint is, if I have too much competition, I can't prosper. And this is exactly what the advocates of the patent system say. They say, well, if I spend money to innovate and come up with a product, if it's too easy for people to compete with me, then how can I make a profit? And, you know, I think that how to make a profit is an interesting question, and it's a tough question, and it's what entrepreneurs face every day. But asking a question is not the same as posing an argument. And uh, uh, th- there may be some endeavors that are not profitable and should not be engaged in. Um, and in fact, something you alluded to, there are actually uh, free market or quasi-free market thinkers and even some libertarians um, who have proposed explicitly augmenting or replacing the patent system with a system of taxpayer-financed genius awards. And uh, I think the one I heard was uh, something on the order of, I don't know, $100 billion a year for medical medical patent innovations. And if, if you understand the patent system and realize that that's only one slice of all the things the patent system covers, if you were to extend this idea gener- generally, we're talking two, three, four, five, twenty $20 trillion a year the government would have to extract from the taxpayer and then have some panel of experts distribute to re- uh, deserving recipients. Um, of innovation. There's just no stopping point. Um, in a way, that type of system would be a more honest system um, because it would show, it would expose the cost of the system. It would be the taxpayer dollars that were being extracted and spent. The patent system hides that. It's the patent system does the same thing in a possibly more um, inefficient and sinister, insidious way because it's hidden and it poses as a property right. At least if it was a welfare benefit like the National Endowment for the Humanities, if it was a National Endowment for Innovation that was funded to the tune of a trillion dollars a year, everyone would see, hey, I'm getting taxed to support everyone who appeals to this government board for a reward every year. That's clearly not free market. I just remembered something. Sorry. I'm just remembering something. Hold on a minute. Okay. All right, Stefan, as we wrap up now, uh, I want you to tell people two things. First, how can they find you online? And second, uh, just very briefly, what's the title of the work that you did, which I guess was an adaptation of an article you wrote for the Journal of Libertarian Studies on the subject of intellectual property? Okay, fine. Yes, um, I have a website, and uh, I have one dedicated towards innovation and intellectual property, which is probably the easiest way for people interested in this topic, which is C4SIS.org, which stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Um, and the book, uh, the monograph I wrote was called uh, Against Intellectual Property, and you can find it on that site, uh, free to download. And uh, I hope to produce a successor volume someday uh, called uh, Copy This Book. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, Stefan, I appreciate your time. There's obviously a lot more that can be said on this topic, but I have people basically begging me to talk about it, and I thought, well, let's start with patents, because even patents you could do multiple episodes on, but at least this helps us get our feet wet on an important and controversial issue. So thanks again, especially thanks again for thanks for taking some time out of your vacation to come on my crummy show. I, I appreciate you doing that. Thanks a lot. I, I love your show. It's an honor. Good to do it. Thank you very much, Stefan. Stefan Kinsella, everybody. C4SIF.org is the website you want to check out. Let's talk about the remaining programs for this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking to one of the authors of the new book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Maybe in trying to master all this material, you're doing it all wrong. Maybe you're pursuing avenues and means of study that are actually ineffective, and I think I've been doing that myself, we'll learn tomorrow about, well, frankly, how to learn so that the material stays with you. 
On Friday, we'll talk to Will Grigg, a friend of this program, about the situation in Ferguson. So you'll definitely want to tune in for those. Remember, you can learn the history and economics they didn't teach you at my website, libertyclassroom.com. Thanks so much for your support, everybody. Thanks to my supporting listeners in particular at supportinglisteners.com who are getting transcripts of all the interviews, discounts at Liberty retailers all over the place, and the Kindle version of my forthcoming book, and many goodies to be added in the next few weeks. It's unbelievable. One day you're going to go to supportinglisteners.com, and there's just going to be an explosion there of all kinds of fun stuff that you guys will get in exchange for helping me out. Supportinglisteners.com. All right, everybody, how to learn tomorrow. We'll see you then. The Tom Woods Show.